Well, good afternoon. This is uh, our Michael Fisher here in Calgary, Alberta, and I am going to be doing Fear Talk number nine with a very special guest that somebody I've followed his work for many years in reading and his colleagues on terror management theory. But today we're actually going to just do a really free form talk, um, and it's Sheldon, forgot your last name, Solomon, for a moment. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, and you're in where, Sheldon, right now? I am in um, uh, upstate New York, a little town, Saratoga Springs, New York, halfway between Manhattan and Montreal. And I, I work at a small liberal arts college called Skidmore College. And you're born and raised American, are you? Well, uh, yeah, I grew up in Manhattan, um, you know, which is like a different planet compared to where I am. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, so I'm I'm a Canadian, so it's going to be a nice cross border connection here too as we move into this conversation. It'll take us a little while to warm up, but I want to share first with the audience, uh, Sheldon, just what Fear Talk is. I put it as sure. Fear Talk as one word, and it could just as easily be Sex Talk. As far as I'm concerned, it's that fundamental of a concept that our culture equally in a certain way is phobic toward. And so when I started the series, right, just like talking about sex or doing sex education and all the controversy, I think fear talk, fear education in a healthy way is just as controversial and difficult. So I said, I'm gonna look around for people where I can have a dialogue at that kind of depth and the kind of comfort level with something called the fear talk, but we'll go into as many depths and diversities and scope and context as we wish really fluidly so it's not like an interview really scripted I'm not trying to go any one place sure. and the main thing was it's a co-inquiry I wanted a co-inquiry I don't want arguments necessarily there's places for arguments we can do that in our publications we can do that in certain kind of media but this was co-inquiry where I'm actually working with another intelligence and someone like yourself, Sheldon, has for 30 plus years, and I'm 30 plus years on this topic of fear in whatever terms we might call it, that, okay, there's a couple ideas here about defense intelligences in the yeah. system, right? In the world, in cultures, in cultural evolution and so on. So I'm just looking at us coming with these two perspectives, and today that's what we're going to do. We're going to share our intelligence as best we can, but the more interesting thing is for me is to create a third set of intelligences that comes from what you and I probably on our own couldn't maybe even come up to. So there's my kind of ideal for a well, great dialogue. Um, I'm on board with that um, fact that, you know, it's, uh, it's grounds for great hope, I think when we can step back and recognize that humans at our best are, you know, have the capacity for cumulative wisdom. Uh, uh, you know, if you watch too much news these days, it's hard to uh, buy that statement, but I, I, I do believe it's true. Uh, that's my dog in the background, Michael. He'll stop in a second. Uh, no problem. Uh, uh, <laughs> We've been locked so, down for so long. So really, you know, yeah, I've been locked down for so long as have we. So let's let's just declare outright that we are in a context of a very challenging moment in human history in the modern yeah. world, That's in right. the postmodern world, which is this quarantine, lockdown, coronavirus, call it what you will, and all yeah. those dynamics. So that adds a you know a full spice to what you and I are doing. And I also invite for a moment the intelligences from species other than ourselves and maybe even species greater than ourselves. Yeah, That's let's bring part them of the into planet. the equation. That's right. Yeah, nice. So I'm going to ask you to just start, just as we warm up, with uh, your favorite Camus quote. And I Well, I, you know, by far my favorite. And uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised. I thought I knew Camus pretty well. Uh, but I ran into this one um, in a, a footnote of an annotated edition of Moby Dick, and it just surprised me where evidently in his notebooks, Camus said, come to terms with death, thereafter anything is possible. And uh, I saw that, you know how sometimes a single phrase is 
so arresting that I can't get that out of my head. Uh, even if it's an overstatement, I think it's a tall bar, but no harm in having lofty aspirations. Thank you. And I'm going to put links to your work and the terror management theory work that you've been a co-founder with your other colleagues so people can look up more. But that quote that you just gave by Camus is actually in the film, which will be part of our conversation today, I'm sure. And it's the film called The Planet of the Humans by Jeff Gibbs, executive producers uh, Michael Moore and right. uh, Ozzy Zenner. So um, in the film, you add something to the end of the Camus quote, which is just your spontaneous reaction. And this is what you said. I find that thought downright inspiring. <laughs> I, I don't remember having said that, but I do uh, find it uh, inspiring, um, even if it appears somewhat counterintuitive. It is. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I'm a professor, but I don't really consider myself a scholar. I come from a working class background, so I define myself as a dishwasher who's read a few books here and there. But that that quote by Camus, it just captures, in my opinion, it's just raw, crystallized wisdom, a synthesis of uh, seminal ideas from theology, from philosophy, from religion. And it's just something that people have come back to time and time again. On, on the one hand, um, uh, one of the things that renders us unique as human beings is that we're smart enough to know that, like all living things, we too will someday die. And that uh, the fear or anxiety that is engendered by that unwelcome realization when we try to distance ourselves from it or, or deny it, uh, you know, that's when it, it, we bury it under the psychological bushes, as it were, and it comes back to bear bitter and malignant fruit. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, folks who have the good fortune by virtue of circumstance or, or their character or disposition, you know, to really be able to explicitly ponder what it means to be alive in light of the fact that uh, we are transient creatures here for a relatively inconsequential amount of time. Yeah, I, I buy the argument theologically, philosophically, as well as psychologically and empirically uh, that that can bring out the, the best in us and that our most noble and heroic aspirations are the result of the rare individual um, who's uh, able to live life to the fullest by understanding, as Heidegger put it, that we can be summarily obliterated, not in some vaguely unspecified future moment, but at any second in our lives. So yeah, that's why I find that so uplifting. It's, it's a nice recognition to me when I, to be inspired by a quote that's about death, right? Yeah. <laughs> acceptance, acceptance of death. And, you know, it's not about necessarily dreams of what comes after, but what I hear in the way you use that, and I think Camus would use this as probably most existential, existentialist, it is what the opportunities are. The that's possibilities right. that that door of... Beyond the thing yes. that, well, my, so my fear of death is not closing well, down those possibilities. That's correct. It, it's the, in fact, the, uh, you know, I've been preoccupied with Heidegger lately. I avoided him for 40 years because yeah. he was a Nazi. That's no good. But Nazis are people too. Uh, and I, I really am enamored these days with Heidegger's language where he talks about, uh, you know, the awareness of death is extraordinarily anxiety provoking. Uh, but I love where Heidegger then goes on and he says, yeah. But there's, in his turgid language, borrowing from Kierkegaard, there's antipathetic and sympathetic aspects to anxiety. Um, and, and, you know, in English, he's like, yeah, anxiety is unpleasant and uh, we flee from it, uh, you know, and that's what makes us culturally constructed meat puppets who uh, are tranquilized by the trivial. 
But he also says that, you know, anxiety, fear uh, can also serve uh, as a, a calling. Uh, and uh, that what it does is to, uh, if we're not in immediate mortal danger, it, it gives us uh, the time and mental space to step back and to just observe that uh, here we are uh, put in a world in a time and place not of our choosing uh, and that we don't get to choose our particular circumstances and yet within those confines we get to choose everything else that happens the possibility of possibilities and, and i love when heidegger then says that at our best when when we realize that that it, 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 again, his language is turgent. He calls it anticipatory resoluteness. I had to look up those words, that we're looking forward to the future, that we're doing so uh, with great determination, and he says, with unshakable joy. And I, and I love that. Again, even if it's naive, uh, this idea that if you're able to confront our, our, if we are able to confront our fears and anxieties directly, uh, that we can come out on the other side uh, uplifted and inspired. And I like that. And my fear these days, not to um, bash uh, psychological interventions because they're all important, uh, but I think that sometimes we're too quick to try and blot out anxiety, uh, you know, by distracting ourselves or through medication, uh, rather than working through those fears and anxieties. Easier said than done, but I do think that's what we've done. Yeah, well said, easier said than done. I often say that as well. And uh, one of the things I'm curious about in, you know, what would be a great fear education? You know, from a child going all the way through the system, right, in curriculum. I'm an educator. So I'm thinking always curriculum design. And that's yeah. why terror management theory or fear management theory, what I use, and all the combinations of what, wouldn't it be great that that actually becomes like a core curriculum? So there wouldn't be a thing about, oh, fear, oh, what is fear, oh, and, and, and then all the, oh, well, we can solve that with love and hope and yeah. all the great pills, yeah, all right. Those, I mean right? this as the highest compliment, but you're betraying um, a bygone day of maximum uh, hope and optimism with regard to education. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to make my students read uh, Aldous Huxley. Um, you know, we would read Doors of Perception, but then we would read Huxley in like Look Magazine for your younger listeners. Uh, this would be like Newsweek or Parade Magazine, where Huxley said, we need to overhaul education from day one. And, uh, you know, he's like, wow, you know, uh, this was back in the days of hallucinogens, LSD, love, sex, death, the three most important things that are, they're not even part of any formal educational curriculum. And Huxley's point that is just a reiteration of your excellent one, Michael, is uh, isn't it uh, somewhat necessary, particularly now that we begin to weave those notions into uh, education from minute one? It doesn't mean that you get to school and you're still wearing a diaper and the first thing your teacher says is you're going to die. <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> One of the uh, researchers I have read, and I'm going to get to my Camus quote in a sec because this is yeah, something. please. But one of the researchers I re I really enjoyed was uh, Robert Sardello. He's you know he comes from kind of spiritual psychologies. I think he yes. went off as a post Jungian and developed, and I really respected his his book way back called Freeing the Soul from Fear in 1999. Here, there was one of the things that he put in there, which I thought was like an, an ethical methodological. Uh, positioning on the topic of fear and he said we ought to be aware that when we enter a conversation I'm paraphrasing enter a conversation about the notion of fear just in the largest sense not could be all the fears but we're talking right. about fear itself in a sense right in our self relationship to fear he, he said one of the things we ought to do just ethically is to ensure as best we can to not overly 
indulge in trying to create more fear by talking about fear. In other words, using fear, right? Yes. The topic of getting attention and then manipulating that attention. So pedagogically, right, from a point of view, that's not what we want to, we're talking about here today. We're not no. talking about fear as so it like sex. It will captivate us, then we got you, then we're gonna sell you something, and then we're gonna take you where we want to because we're the authorities on the topic. A big contradiction, right, to back off, and that's not easy to do, right? That's not easy to do, but it's about an awareness, from my point of view, of I'm not here to increase your fear. You may get stimulated, you may get triggered, you may start, what is the whole death prompt? Yeah right as an intervention but it's also a research tool for awareness yeah so no, that's I, where it's so educational right this is not about manipulation in that sense of how it's been brought on politically yeah and that uh, uh well put uh, a critical distinction oh. i'm going to give my camus quote go yeah i don't know if you've heard this one so i'm quite curious um 1946 He's in the French underground near the end of the war, and he publishes in the underground magazine called Combat. Okay. Found this quote um, by somebody else who had quoted him. The 17th century was the century of mathematics. 18th century was that of physics. 19th century of biology. And the 20th century is the century of fear. Wow. Now, I'll, I'll let you respond. I just thought that to me is the poetic, you know, epical statement of our pursuit of Western enlightened knowledge. What does it come to? Where was that knowledge starting? What was our motivation for the knowledge? And where did we come to? The yeah. 20th century often said is one of the bloodiest centuries you know, historically and so on. Over wow. Um, no, I, I was not familiar with that quote. Um, how prescient, however. Um, to be silly but not, if he were about, I wonder how he would characterize our current century. Um, I, I agree that the, the, the 20th century characterized as fear is certainly appropriate where do we go from fear because this this is the wow. 21st century i added in my dis in my dissertation because <laughs> i used this to open my dissertation wow and i said the 21st century is the century of terror wow 9-11 had just come, Y2K, we're now connected on this massive network, right, of flow of information, uh -huh. where those qualities of emotional experiencing and the cumulative effect of post-traumatic conditions yeah. reproduced and utilized by often all kinds of authorities, and I'm not saying authorities are all to blame because we're the feeders, you know. Yes. The people on the ground are also feeding. Yeah. Wow. So, no, I like that. And I, I think that, uh, again, it's apt. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's fear raised to the power of terror. Um, in part, as you note, in, unless some a misunderstanding you, Michael, that we've got all of these things happening. So we've got a confluence of events, none of them historically unprecedented, but, you know, really coming together at the same time. So we, we've got the threat of war, we've got environmental uh, devastation, we've got rampant economic inequality, we've got, uh, you know, epidemically high levels of psychopathology all at the same time in a world that as you just put it is profoundly interdependent and interconnected in ways that have made life better for lots of people no doubt 
and also a lot worse for lots of people. And now we're all at risk because of that. And then when you factor in, um, you know, the internet and social media, uh, what we've got is, and this is, um, you know, Hitler was great at what he did, but he didn't have the internet and he didn't have control uh, over all of the major media outlets. Uh, and so now you have the capacity for real time disinformation that is specifically intended to maintain high levels of fear and rage not the kind of fear that illuminates, but rather the kind of fear uh, that demonizes and devastates. Yeah, I, I, uh, to be corny, I fear you are quite right when you describe our current century in terms of terror. Yes. So I want to move on to the film now a little bit. If you're yeah. okay. So could you just give us a little quick overview of how you got involved in the film by Jeff Gibbs that I mentioned earlier? The planet yeah oh uh, so uh, I'm gonna be honest and tell you I'm in my early Mr. Magoo phase and I'm uh, I'm not sure that I'm gonna be uh, totally accurate in terms of the timing um I know though from uh, looking at my little stint in the movie that it had to be four or five years ago um, that Jeff contacted me and said he had become familiar with our work. Even there, I don't really remember whether he read something, whether he saw me yammering on YouTube, but what he was interested in was our claim at the time uh, that um, death anxiety uh, was ultimately responsible uh, for humankind's insatiable desire for money and stuff, and that and our contempt for nature and um, uh, our capacity to devastate the environment, um, and that was and so he he called me and um, said, "Hey, I'm Jeff Gibbs. I'm making a movie." And I was like, hey, um, awesome, uh, I'll talk to anybody. And uh, I, I had no idea at the time of Jeff's connection to Michael Moore. And uh, so to make a short story long, Jeff came to Skidmore. We, we spoke for uh, several hours uh, and uh, very thoughtful, uh, very intelligent, very right-minded in my estimation. Um, and I wasn't quite sure at the time uh, what the movie was about entirely, and neither was Jeff, although if he were talking with us, I would defer to him if he felt otherwise. And what I mean more particularly, Michael, is that we really did speak for hours. Uh, and um, and the, the point that I was trying to make was that his film, as I understood it, was trying to point out the urgency of our, uh, the need to attend to the environment in light of the upcoming uh, environmental apocalypse because of climate change. And what I thought I could contribute to the project uh, was our understanding of the role of death anxiety in perpetuating some of the behaviors that made it difficult to tackle those problems head on. And I know that Jeff was interested in that also. I also knew uh, that he had misgivings about what the green movement was doing uh, because we talked about Bill McKibben and uh, I know Bill McKibben's work quite well. Uh, uh, we correspond, uh, Bill has been uh, at Skidmore, uh, and um, all that he said was, well, um, and I kind of remember this as Jeff was leaving, he said, well, you might be a little bit surprised at uh, what I'm finding and what I'm learning uh, about the environmental movement. And, uh, then, so I didn't, as far as I could tell, uh, we had a great day, didn't hear anything for three or four years until a few months ago. 
uh, um, when Jeff contacted me via email and he said um, that the film had changed quite a bit, that um, in fact so much so that um, most of what I said had been cut out of the film. And I, I mean, he was apologetic. I was like, no need for apology. That was never what this was about. And then he said, or via email, something along the lines of it just got too unwieldy that uh, they decided that their primary focus was gonna be uh, to present these ideas that he knew would be controversial about the green part of it. And, um, and that's all I had heard, except that uh, no one wanted to show the film. That evidently it was so controversial that film festivals, there were, that's why. Okay. Uh, and uh, again, I hope I'm not betraying any confidences. I don't know that Jeff yeah. would object. Is That's why they decided to distribute the movie through Michael Moore's uh, YouTube channel, I think, um, was to just get it out there. And uh, so, uh, honestly, that's it. I, I watched the movie. Um, I found it uh, quite striking. There's my little bit in the middle, which is almost a non sequitur. If you cut my chunk out of the movie, not much would change. And, um, and then I watch the end of the movie and I'm like, yeah, you're going to piss a lot of people off. <laughs> and pissed them off and scared. Yeah. And, and, um, and I, I understood that there would be a ferocious reaction which there also, is. Also, Michael, I don't have the skills to evaluate the merits of the argument. So I'm agnostic on that front. I, I accept, except to uh, agree with Jeff, although I don't know that this point was made as vividly in the film as it was the day that we spoke. And that is that, you know, any effort, even well-intentioned, to propose that we're going to be able to go from fossil fuels to green energy and be able to have the same number of people in the world living at the same level that we now currently enjoy, that has always struck me uh, as diluted, as I put it in the film. But that's not my idea. Bill McKibben says the same thing in his book. What is it? Earth, the E-E-A-R-T-H, Life on a Tough New Planet. He says the same thing. So I don't consider anything that I said, and I'm not trying to sound defensive. I don't consider anything I said in the film to bear on that question, except to second the idea that you know, we're not going to be flying to Europe in solar paneled airplanes. <laughs> <Anyway. Okay. laughs> if you weren't in that film, I agree with you. And in a sense, it was a non sequitur, but absolutely at another level. And this is where I want to dig a little bit and be sure. curious of a connection I've made with Michael Moore's film, Bowling for Columbine. Absolutely. 1999. You know, the mass terror school shooting, kind of the real Great first, film. the first one that just gave, had so much impact. And then That's he right. came on the scene and did a really interesting, artistic, and very demanding psychological film that also was incredibly controversial. Yes. I was in just starting my dissertation on studying the culture of fear. And wow. that film came out at the same time. And I just went, Okay, so here's the connection I had. I'm curious of your response. So first thing I want to say before I make that connection with the first uh, Bowling for Columbine, Michael Moore, again, he was director and he was writer. Here he's the executive producer in Planet of the Humans. Is if you weren't in that film, Planet of the Humans, if you would have taken that out, I think we would have missed the opportunity to try and understand something about Jeff Gibbs. Again, this is my hypothesis. I think there is no environmental film I have ever seen. And I'm, I was, I, I'm out of the 70s. I was an ecology guy. I, I took a career in environmental biology. I, you know, this is all my youth for decades. Okay. And then I went more into psychology and education. And, and I want to see know what's behind why we don't change. Yes. 
wow, Jeff Gibbs in that film, if he would have just stayed, because he was hunting, what's the motivation? He kept saying, what's the motivation? That's correct. And now we're on terror management theory ground. We're on fear management ground, right? We're on that deeper level of motivation that's shaping our world as individuals, as collective. Yes. So if we, he, we wouldn't have had you in, what would have happened is he would have gone through and sort of questioned and everybody would said, oh yeah, he's questioning the economic profit motive and the sleeping together of green yes. alternative economies with the capitalist oil economy. And we yes. would have been, okay, that's a fair, you know, maybe there is some mismotivations, contradictions within the green environmental leaders and movements and organizations. But that was a lot. And that's easy to take in. That's hard enough to take in watching that yeah. for, for somebody who's really green bought, right? But their worldview is based on a green yeah. saved planet that we can actually overcome, transcend. We will be a better, greater. Yes. Et cetera. So here's what he, I see is the second part. He, he kept that motivation as the main theme. He held his audience with that. Thank you, Jeff, for doing that brilliantly. I thought it was great how he did it. He let people speak for themselves on film, man. Yeah, it was awesome. Some of them did not look good. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, that's where he, you know, that's the, the genius of Michael Moore. It is Jeff. the genius of Michael Moore. And I just said, <laughs> right? they are so built on the same because they've worked together on all, all these yes. films of Michael Moore's. And so then, but he wasn't satisfied with that. And he went a step deeper. And he went into what is the, he came to you and with the joke, I need you to be my clinical social psychologist. That's <laughs> paraphrasing. And, and you, you kind of chuckled, right? And I think the reason you chuckled the moment he said that is the same reason I went, that never happens in an environmental film. Documentaries never go that deep. Yes. You know, the odd time we might say, well, we have a fear of nature, you know, we don't, yeah. harmony with nature and, and that's about it no no this was he was going down to is it the fear of death that is driving yes. as the other motivation and again he didn't play that out he couldn't in the film he couldn't do them both he stayed more with that motivation but it was there yeah you know the fact that you were there i just had to contact you because i well, said that doesn't happen in environmental documentary. That kind of deep analysis. You know, thank you, Michael. That I, uh, that's helped me, and I, I love that because I, I joked with Jeff at one point that we're going to need a second film. <laughs> it, you know, starting right at that bingo moment. But you make a, a I think a, a a point. This is just an anecdote, but. Um, you know, I do you know E.O. Wilson, the yeah. so you know, future of life, and then Bill McKibben. Um, now E.O. Wilson, I have written to for years. Oh, uh, now famous people are famous and they're busy, but they are trying to get him to, to, to expose him to our ideas and engage him at that level. Same with Bill McKibben, you know, he's been to Skidmore. I've spoken on programs with him, like in Seattle and stuff. I've sent him our work, and he's a very nice man. So this is not a criticism, it's an observation. But several times Bill has said, I just don't see the connection between what you're doing and what I'm doing. And you're quite right. For whatever reason, Jeff surely did see the connection. He did. And if, if there's any collateral effect of that, well, here we are talking about it. And um, it, it, this is not about getting our faces all over anywhere. It's about raising that point. That, and you sent me uh, your first email message to me was, yeah, the, the movie is really explicit about what is happening you're talking a little bit about why it is and we and that's where we come in uh, you know it doesn't make us the all-encompassing repositories of wisdom it makes us in a position uh, to um you know in our world 
just to elucidate the motivational underpinnings of some of these behaviors that as long as we see them in purely economic terms, I don't see much hope of radical alteration. Could be I'm, wrong, but... I'm well, with I, you I, and I could be wrong too. <laughs> yes. We'll be wrong together. Here, here's his statement he makes in the film. I'm just going to read from the transcript just before he interviews you in, in the film, Jeff. So he's, he's done a lot of analysis. This is at about the 40 minute mark of the film or so. Okay. And, he says, and he says, and why for most of my life have I fallen for the illusion that green energy would save us? Yes. He's setting up his own self-analysis. Oh, yeah. At, at a level that is so rare for the environmental activist types. Yeah. Not that I think that they aren't doing good work. Right. That's and not the point. I have never personally, because I'm, I see myself as an eco-environmentalist type two educator, and I've always just never fully been able to hang in with their discourse and their, yes. their politics at times, because I feel like, whoa, we got to have some deep self-reflection here. Not yeah. just about what they are, they over there, the world, the baddies, the you know, and so on. So I know enough to know intuitively, and that was I was in my twenties when I basically stepped back. Um, I could have done the charge, you know, and yeah. tried to save the world. So he set it up right with this wonderful little bit of self analysis. So now I want to go to Michael Moore's if I if, and then you know, yeah. the space. Bowling for Columbine, Michael Moore, in that film, I'm watching it. Okay, it's all about, quote, guns. It's all about violence, you know, in America, blah, blah, blah. On the surface, right? Yeah, that's, that's why it's a great film. Together. The politics, the right, the left, you know. So he does all that, and he plays out like a good theatrical, you know, drama. <laughs> the tragedy and the yeah. opposites, right? So he, he knows how to do a story. Uh, but what happened in the moment he at some point and i can't remember all the full context he says he starts walking with this guy down the streets in hollywood you know in los angeles okay. right and he's and who's this guy he's walking with oh dr barry glasner yes who had just written and published the book the cult american culture of fear yes boom yeah there is, and then he goes into talking about that a little bit. Again, the film, just a little bit of Barry Glasner in there. But you see, he, he wasn't satisfied. Michael Moore knew the film is not the culture of guns. It's the culture of fear. Oh, you know, I, I feel like that. Uh, you've done me a great service uh, because I'm a big fan of Michael Moore. I, I find him uh profound and important but i would not have been able to articulate like you just did what makes the work great you know bowling for columbine is a movie about guns only superficially and if it were just that it would be important but not profound and of enduring value yeah Classic, really classic. And I, I like you then transposing that idea for Jeff's film. Um, you know, since we communicated um, a, a couple of days ago, uh, I keep getting, you know, two or three emails a day from around the world, people I don't know, you know, just saying, you know, dude, I, I, you know, I'm watching this film and, you know, there you were right in the middle of it. And I can't put my finger on it, but I think there's something there. And it's not, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with what you said, which is it's, it's both what, it's actually, it's what Jeff said right before I start talking is it's actually, I don't want to be overly histrionic here, but it's the pivotal moment in the film in that it then shifts to the film changes uh, quite a bit thereafter and 
you made me, you've now really made it quite vivid why people, um, psychologicalizing here, but the level of condemnation is way beyond whether or not it's factually correct. And that suggests that you're onto something when you describe the degree of offense on the part of some folks, he is challenging their worldview. Wow. So just sit in a therapy room, you're with your client, you know, instead wow. of director, audience, <laughs> therapist, client, and you're going to confront at some point their wow. defensive ego. Yeah. You're going to confront their denial of the death of the ego as essential exactly. to growth. Yeah. And change and transformation possibilities we've talked about, right? It is no different. And so I keep coming to both Michael Moore's film and that for 99 coming to this one in, you know, 2020, all these years. This is what I call a cultural therapy. It's the attempt to move the therapeutic movement. And I don't just mean psychological therapy, right? Sure. I'm talking about a therapy in, in a kind of much broader sense. That's why I use that word instead of therapy. And you're trying to do it through art. Yes. They are leading through art. Bless their hearts. I'm an artist myself. I know the value of that. It can sometimes, you know, get through defenses that you can't get through if you're doing direct content. Oh, absolutely. You know this in the TMT work. It's by using subliminal primes and yeah. for, for prompting. You get to places and truths, right, about how the human mind works without that direct confrontation. And yeah. what can we expose? What can we expose? So I often said to my, my critique of Michael Moore in my own writing has been, he's a great artist for our time, great activist. He's not quite so good of an educator. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have to say that about Jeff. <laughs> fair enough. That's, uh, no, that's well put. Now I'm going to try to sum up, summarize as we come to the closing here soon. I think if I put in my own words, this is what Jeff was trying to do. And this is where the serious part of how do we actually do put yeah. TMT into applications, which I know you guys have been working on this 35 plus years. I've been working on it for 30. Is how do you actually put some of these fundamental Beckerian, Ernest Becker's ideas and others yeah. that we've, you know, we're all interdisciplinary, all, all, all of us folks that, that are working yeah. on this fear management, terror management. I, I summarized what I think Jeff is, is trying to do, and it would have been sort of maybe, you know, in hindsight, it's easy. If he just came out and said, you know, the truth has blown my mind. Wow. The, film, the truth has blown my mind, and I want to blow your mind too. Yeah. But now, it has been fucking hard for me to do it, to blow my mind. It scared the shit out of me. Yeah. And I know that this is going to be hard for you, and it may scare the shit out of you. And that is because I've had to come to face there is no rescue, savior from the green alternative environmental movement. Well put. Now we can go together, right? Yes. Now we can go together and walk that path of darkness. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, yeah. That that is uh, very lovely, and again, I I I don't want to speak for Jeff, you know, on the basis of one day together, but it was a big day, and my sense is he would embrace that. That that's uh, you know the deep sense of as the Paul Tillich put it, you know, the theologian, just ultimate concern. Um, ultimate concern, yeah. And yeah. how is that? This goes back to my Robert Cerdello's ethic of our methodology, our pedagogy, right? As we enter the dark territories. Yeah. To convey just, and I, and I want to ask you guys, you, through you, Salman, because you're here to speak, is 
you know, your, th your colleagues and so on on terror management theory, and there's so many researchers now beyond the, the original three that you are part of, that I know of. And have you thought about that, how difficult you've walked the path of trying to get this theory into the psychological association, number one, into the academies, into various parts of the world? What would you comment about how difficult that's been and, and what would be your lessons maybe that you've learned on how difficult that is for others? Well, I mean, sure. We were um, young when we started with these ideas. We were brash and annoying. Um, the first talk that I gave on these ideas was called The Psychopathology of Social Psychology. And the talk was about how uh, our colleagues don't study anything interesting uh, because they are so um, devoted to advancing their careers that they only study things that they have paradigms in the lab uh, to do. And that misses all the important questions, which is out in the world. Now, that's a, that turns out to be an unfair indictment of uh, uh, social psychology, but it sounded good at the time. Uh, but, you know, then when we started talking about Ernest Becker's ideas, um, you know, I could clear out a conference room of 200 eminent psychologists in five minutes. I would just be like, oh, we have a theory. It's based on Ernest Becker. It's about death. And boom, you know, they'd be storming the doors. Uh, and uh, our first paper took eight years to publish. Wow. Uh, you know, that, that we sent it out to the American psychologist where it was rejected six months later with a single sentence review. I have no doubt that these ideas are of no interest to any psychologist whatsoever, alive or dead. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, what we would say, just be annoying, is, well, you don't like these ideas because you're afraid of death. And... Um, no, but that's not a way to win. <laughs> no, I, I think Jeff is learning that. <laughs> yeah. And so finally, and the editor of the American Psychologist said, dudes, look, you know, these are interesting ideas, but you're not going to get anywhere until you have empirical corroboration of them. And, and you know, that's what we've done for 35 years. I'm, I'm proud of the work. I, I think that we have established in traditional scientific terms the merits of Ernest Becker's contentions about the role of death anxiety in human affairs. And, and um, you know, and, and so, but, and um, my view is, you know, we write these academic papers, you know, 20 people on earth read them. Um, you know, I tell my students, our work is a great, uh, non-pharmacological intervention for insomnia. If you're having trouble sleeping, uh, grab one of our papers and a paragraph should put you down. Um, the work may be important, that's not for me to judge, but clearly it's not the best way to get these ideas in circulation and to put them to good use. And I'm going to adopt your term, Michael, therapia. I, I think that, and I said this to Jeff um, when he was visiting me at Skidmore, you know, he was like, oh, thank you for talking to me. I'm like, no, uh, you got it backwards. I thank you uh, for being interested enough in these ideas to incorporate them into a work that will be uh, exposed more people to them in five minutes than in five of my lifetimes. So, uh, uh, and, and those of us, and maybe this is the unique prerogative of people like us that are on the back end of our academic careers, because we don't need another academic publication. We need to, and we do have the luxury to consider how do we parlay these ideas uh, into influential action. And I believe it to be that we interface people that have a therapeutic out therapia like outlook uh, on life because I, my view of therapy and uh, I'm in a family therapist. My wife is a therapist. She started in dance therapy. My daughter's a therapist and 
Uh, she does like dancing and drumming and yoga and meditation. Um, therapy, if it's going to be useful in the century of terror, is going to have to be a lot more than just words. Nicely said. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. Wow. We're just right on the, the whole thing that I think is important. And, you know, I told you when I sent you a bit of the transcript from the film, Planet of Humans, just to show you how I pick out certain things and I'm listening and all of a sudden I'm knowing the word that keeps showing up is what I quoted from, you know, from Jeff Gibbs earlier. I kept noticing the word illusion or delusion. Yeah. Bandana Shiva uses it. You used it. And so on. He uses it, Jeff, and so on. And I think this is when, you know, you call somebody's illusion up, right? Yeah. This is what Heidegger did. That's correct. He did it to Western civilization. He did it to the whole enlightenment. <laughs> he sure did. Was he liked? <laughs> <laughs> no, neither was Nietzsche because, you know, he said, oh, this, the, everyone loves the enlightenment. And Nietzsche's like, this is the most calamitous stupidity by which we shall perish someday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that line, but that's great. Yeah, and then uh, I, I, can't, I think that's uh, the gay science, but it doesn't matter. It explains why he sold like 40 books at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Schopenhauer <laughs> didn't do much better, you know, off his heels. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so as we wrap up here, I just wondered Jet, if you have anything that you want to ask me per se, um, we can just explore in maybe five minutes here of what are some of the potentials of what we actually have been talking about today? Yeah, well, what do you have in mind for next steps on your end, professionally and personally? I'm, I'm kind of like you, you know, I've been 30 years cranking out the publications, seeing the little response that one gets. Um, but there are obviously some exceptions always. And I think particularly this day for me is historical. So I'm speaking for myself here, just from my heart is it's historical for me to find uh, access. As you know, knowledge is not just knowledge available. Knowledge is about access. Yes. And it's about all the politics of knowledge that goes with the construction of how capitalization of knowledge occurs that's right and, and that that took me a long time i'm working class like you nobody ever told me about that stuff yeah never even if told I... me about it in university and yeah. i have learned some hard lessons uh, yeah. that often have to do with exclusion and exile feelings and experiences but you and i both have a lot of privilege as well as we i'm sure we both recognize tons yes. of privilege and tons of privilege to be able to teach, make videos, be in front of people in public and have influence. So my gut, my gut sense is, you know, just stirring off today is this film is a pedagogical, you know, gift for our time. For a, I'm going to call it a century of terror. Yeah. I'm going to suggest that you folks in TMT, more than anyone I know in the field of psychology, this is just my view, you are on the button that needs to be brought forward in the century of terror that we're in. And I'm the educator. <laughs> That's my background. Curriculum design. Yeah. Well, design. So if you just think of the arts, right? The yeah. performance, the performativity and the capability of the arts world, i.e. films and so on, and the psychological world, and the educational world, even those three to me are articulating themselves right now in this yeah. film, what we're doing. And I'm so grateful to it. Um, in terms of real ideas after that, you know, I, if I had to add in a perspective to it all, I'm working with a colleague named Four Arrows, Don Jacobs from Fielding Graduate University. And he's been doing 35 years on a indigenous perspective. To understanding fear management. Yeah, I saw some of your writings. And so awesome. you bring that in as well, right? Which is pre-enlightenment knowledge, right? Yeah. Not captivated already in the culture of fear. Not to say that all indigenous people are not captivated. They are captivated in the culture. That's right. Of fear. And that's what he Faro says. He says it's not about that we're all great models as indigenous peoples. And he's he considers himself, you know, with, within that indigenous world. He's yeah, yeah. Initiation ceremonies with the Oglala Sioux and so on. But he knows that there's a time of 99% of our history on, on this planet as homos 
where we weren't inducted into a culture of fear. That's and right. We were embedded in learning from other sources like nature for herself of how she yeah. had fear. Right? Before we had this big, big brain that can do yeah. all these fancy manipulations and cognitive metacognitions of the future and the yeah. possibilities of death, dying, mortality, injury. Yeah. So no, I just think what I've just thrown to you is a package of invitation for all of us, whoever this may speak to, our video that we've made today, to come in from your positions, your, your avenues, and many other avenues that I didn't even mention. This is an inter-transdisciplinary process to, I believe, obviously still, like Jeff says in the end of his film, I still believe in awareness is the answer. Me too. So today we started that. I thank you so much, Sheldon. It's my pleasure. Let's uh, keep going at some point. We will. Okay. Bye, my friend. Thanks, Michael. Have a great day.